Issues on the Asian side are more problematic. Very little is known of the people inhabiting Mongolia or South Siberia before 200 BC, over five centuries after the dispersion of the lost tribes. Ethnohistory provides abundant evidence of large people groups of almost entirely unknown origins who settled in Mongolia and South Siberia, which were active areas for mass migration from across Central Asia. As a nomadic people traveling over vast distances but leaving few permanent settlements, the ancient ancestors of the Mongolians are particularly difficult to trace. The nomadic character of the equestrian Mongols, whose predecessors ruled an empire from Eastern Europe to the Pacific, the absence of any real natural barriers across thousands of miles of territory that comprise the largest plain in the world and the history of hundreds of migrations of people groups, some known, most largely unknown, would lead the objective scholar to question the genetic basis for Mr. Murphy's assumption that those living in Mongolia and South Siberia today harbor essentially the same gene pool as that present thousands or even tens of thousands of years ago. DNA studies of ancient human remains from Mongolia and Siberia predating the dispersion of Israel are conspicuously absent. To my knowledge, the only ancient mummies that have been found adjacent to Mongolia are the Tokarians, an ancient and mysterious civilization of blonde and red-headed Caucasian-appearing people who inhabited the Tarim Basin approximately 3,000 years ago. The Chinese government to date has not permitted DNA testing on these mummies, but mainstream geneticists and anthropologists do not believe the Tokarians to be the principal ancestors or even significant genetic contributors to modern Mongolian, Siberian, or Uyghur populations. Our awareness of the ethnogenetic distinctiveness of the Tokarian people, and even their very existence comes exclusively from their custom of mummification and from their fortuitous discovery in the desert sands in 1987. The ancient East Asian populations for which we do have some empty DNA data, the Chinese and Japanese, demonstrate strikingly different genetic patterns from those found in modern populations. Ancient human remains tested from Japan contain none of the empty DNA haplogroups shared among 98% of modern Native Americans and 52% of modern Mongolians. Uh, among ancient Chinese studied, only 13% shared a haplogroup with Native Americans, and only two of the haplogroups, B and C, were present at all. Even these ancient Chinese remains are only 2,000 years old, over seven centuries after the dispersion of the northern kingdom of Israel. In contrast, a modern study of central Chinese has demonstrated the presence of all four haplogroups, and the prevalence of the shared haplogroups has increased to 45%. The further back we go, the greater genetic distinctiveness we find between ancient and modern Asian populations. One of the oldest Asian studies of human remains was conducted in the Lindsay area of central China. The authors studied human remains from three different time periods and reported, our results show that the, the genetic backgrounds of the three populations are distinct from each other. Inconsistent with the geographical distribution, the 2,500-year-old Lindsay population showed greater genetic similarity to present-day European populations than to present-day East Asian populations. The 2,000-year-old Lindsay population had features that were intermediate between the, the present-day European 2,500-year-old Lindsay populations and present-day East Asian populations. These relationships suggest the occurrence of drastic spatiotemporal changes in the genetic structure of the Chinese people during the past 2,500 years. The authors further note the three smallest genetic distances for the 2,500-year-old Lindsay population were from the Turkish, Icelander, and Finnish, rather than from East Asian populations. Not only did a 2,500-year-old population with strong European genetic features live in central China, but these people appear to be the oldest inhabitants of China yet identified. Yet geneticists are aware of this group, whose genetic features seem to be almost entirely absent from modern Chinese only because of a recent and relatively unique study. If we were to imagine a hypothetical Lindsay group that might have emigrated to an isolated island in 500 BC, the DNA of their descendants would be completely unrelated to that of modern Chinese and would be classified by proponents of regional affiliation genetics as belonging to a European culture group. Self-proclaimed experts would un undoubtedly declare that this group had been proven not to have originated in China at all. The Lindsay data wreak havoc upon the theories of critics who indiscriminately extrapolate the genetics of modern inhabitants onto ancient peoples without supporting DNA evidence. 
Critics have largely failed to consider scriptural and historical explanations for modern DNA observations. Abraham was a migrant from Ur of the Chaldees and not a native Palestinian. The Lord explicitly forbade intermarriage between Israelites and the native inhabitants of Palestine, commanding, neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. The spiritual and social separation between Israel and the surrounding nations is a frequent scriptural theme. Limited intermarriage occur, occurred between Israelites and the surrounding nations during the captivity in Egypt and the early period of the Kingdom of Israel, mainly consisting of the assimilation of foreign wives. Nonetheless, the continued emphasis on spiritual and social separation between Israel and its neighbors would make it foolish to expect genetic regional affiliation markers gathered from a composite of Canaanites, Phoenicians, Philistines, Egyptians, and other groups then inhabiting the ancient Near East to represent a definitive test of early Israelite ancestry. The Assyrian captivity of the Northern Ten Tribes and the Babylonian captivity of the Kingdom of Judah mark turning points of genetic divergence between the Jews <coughs> who returned to Jerusalem and other Israelite groups. The Jews who returned from the Babylonian captivity found a land with a markedly different ethnic makeup from the predominantly Canaanite Palestine of early Israel. Many of the Canaanite tribes had been completely destroyed, while the Assyrians had resettled men from Babylon and from Kutha and from Ava and from Hamath and from Sepharvim, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of, the, instead of the children of Israel. And they possessed Samaria and dwelt in the cities thereof. Other groups migrated into Palestine during and after the Babylonian captivity. The return to Jews mixed among a population of Babylonians, Syrians, Assyrians, Edomites, Moabites, and others until after the time of the Savior. These intervening centuries provide abundant opportunity for the introduction of numerous regional affiliation haplotypes that were not necessarily present in ancient Israel. The Jews, who lived in the Near East until after the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD and then gradually made their way into the diaspora, should be expected to share vastly greater genetic commonality with modern Palestinians, Arabs, Kurds, and Iraqis than the Lehites who left Jerusalem approximately 600 BC, or the 10 tribes of the Northern Kingdom, which were carried away by the Assyrians between 744 and 721 BC, and then lost to history. Rates of intermarriage increased significantly during and after the Babylonian captivity. Transplanted minority groups are generally more likely to intermarry than more homogenous ethnic groups in their own societies, due to both external cultural pressures and limited internal marriage options. The prophet Ezra initiated separations on a massive scale between Israelite men and their foreign wives. Yet rigid prohibitions on the ubiquitous challenge of intermarriage have rarely been consistently achieved in subsequent generations. WhyMarryJewish.com reports that since 1985, 52% of North American Jews have married non-Jews. Just a few generations of such widespread intermarriage can result in almost a complete loss of initially defining genetic data. <coughs> <coughs> Even if the low 10% intermarriage rate reported prior to 1965 had been maintained steady for 2,600 years, modern Jews would bear little genetic resemblance to ancient Israelites. The Bible reports some 600,000 able-bodied footmen among the Israelites at the time of the Exodus, in addition to women and children, suggesting a likely population of at least 2 million. On at least several occasions, the Jewish population was reconstituted from only a fraction of its former peoples, often with considerable influx of non-Israelite genes. Hebrew scholars estimate that the Jewish population had fallen to approximately 300,000 a century after the Babylonian captivity, rising to between two and five million by the time of Christ, and then falling to less than a million following the Roman Jewish wars. Only a fraction of the Jews returned from Babylon. Only a portion of the Palestinian Jews survived the Roman counterattacks leading to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, and many Jews perished in the European pogroms. The asymmetric nature of all of these events would have resulted in the loss of many Israelite genes from the Jewish gene pool. 
Dr. Robert Pollack observes that Ashkenazi Jews, who constitute 80% of the world Jewish population, descend from a rather small number of families who survived the pogroms of the mid-1600s. Geneticist Thorne Behar notes that from an estimated number of just 25,000 in the 11th century, the Ashkenazi Jewish population had grown to more than 8.5 million at the beginning of the 19th century. <coughs> Daniel Elazar of the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs wrote that at the end of the 11th century, 97% of the world's Jews were Sephardic and just 3% were Ashkenazi. In the mid 